It's now my privilege to introduce Renee King Sonnen of Rowdy Girl Sanctuary, the Texas beef cattle ranch that had a vegan change of heart. Renee's presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. So take it away, Renee. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, John and uh, Reverend Halpern, you too. I appreciate uh, you both. And Mark, um, your work sounds amazing. Um, well, I always like to um, start off by just breathing me out, um, having a moment of silence, and um, just asking the presence of uh, spirit to come in and lead me in the direction I need to go today as I tell this story that I've told over and over again about a cattle rancher in Texas that went vegan. Um, so if we could just have maybe a few seconds of just silence. All right, you know, I'm 63 years old and um, my husband and I have been married not once, but twice. And when we remarried the second time, he had acquired a cattle ranch in Angleton, Texas. His heritage is um, wrapped up in the tradition and culture of cattle ranching. His great grandfather uh, was a cattle rancher that actually you know, brought cows in from San Antonio, just like in the old days, you know, with, with spurs, with a brand. It was the S-O-N brand. And his great grandpa had a slaughterhouse in Houston and eventually a slaughterhouse in Alvin, Texas. It was considered an honorable profession. It was considered, um, you know, a profession that one was doing to really help feed the world. And Tommy, my husband, was very much a traditionalist, uh, still is, uh, but he's vegan now. And uh, when he was getting ready to retire from Dow Chemical, he had several years to go. He wanted to pick up the, the baton, the heritage of his forefathers. And so he bought the land in Angleton that had cows on it. It had about 25, 29 cows on it. And he was going to do what his forefathers had done. Well, when we remarried and I moved in, I really didn't want to move there. I was, uh, I've always been an entrepreneur. I've always been a businesswoman. And I, uh, you know, I, I'm from Texas, but I'm kind of like the rhinestone cowgirl. You know, I had a collection of leather boots. I had shiny satin blouses with fringe. And, you know, I went to rodeos, cook-offs, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I liked, I liked all that cowgirl stuff, but I wasn't really interested in stomping around in cow poop and helping him with, hey, um, that's not really what I was interested in. I was into yoga, the arts. Uh, at the time that we remarried, I was selling real estate, doing very well at it. And so I really, you know, I was like, I don't want to move out there. You move, you move to the city, you know, and I, it always reminds me of the Green Acres. If anybody's ever seen Green Acres, I'm, I know I'm aging myself, you know, but it was like that tug of war, you know. Uh, I want you to move to the city. He wanted me to move to the country. And if he would have moved to the city, I would not be on this Zoom call. Because when I moved to the ranch, very reluctantly, uh, that set in motion some karma. Because, you know, I never wanted to hang out with the cows uh, and help him. That wasn't my mission I love my husband. I remarried him because I wanted to, to be with him. We were like soulmates. We'd, already, we'd been married once. And the reason we divorced was 
because I'm in recovery and I'd had some problems and, and uh, it's, it's no, it's no secret uh, that I'm in recovery, been sober for many years now, but at the time I, when we divorced, I was struggling. And so we remarried because, you know, we always wanted to be together really. And, um, you know, so whenever I moved to the ranch, I was like, you do that and I'll do yoga I'll play my guitar because I was also into music and producing, uh, you know, small events with, uh, I had a Texas women in country music act that I like to mess around with and, you know, just stuff that kept me uh, interested, you know, but being out there with the cows, not really. And, um, but he had a different idea, you know, but uh, he wanted me to get involved with cows. And so, you know, I would go out there with him on occasion while he was mending a fence or, you know, working on a gate or taking out hay. Uh, you know, I'd go out there, but uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't get involved with what he was doing. But I got out there and I started doing yoga with the cows. I would just like be out there in the middle of it all. And I would think to myself, I wonder if I keep a real mindful uh, approach, if I'm, if I'm very mindful, you know, if I can go be in the middle of these cows and if they'll, if they'll do anything to me, will they charge me? I mean, I was very curious. And so what I found out is when I would get out in the middle of the cows and I would do tree pose or triangle or, you know, at home, they would just look at me and they would chew their cud. And there was something about being with these cows that started to mesmerize me. I began to be very entranced. I get in a little trance with them, you know, and it would cause me to, uh, I, I would forget that I was, you know, that I was there with my husband doing chores and I was just in the state of being with them. And um, I wasn't a vegan. I ate filet mignon, medium rare. And, but I was beginning to, uh, something was knocking on the door, you know. So I started that and then uh, but I didn't help my husband with the gates. I didn't help him with hay. I didn't help him with fences. And so one day he comes home and he says, Renee, I know a rancher up the road that has a couple of baby calves and they don't have a mama. And, you know, how would you like to have a couple calves to bottle feed? He said, they, they're real young. They, they're, they're just a few weeks old. And I was like, oh, really? You know, and I didn't have any kids, you know, I could never have kids of my own. And so the idea of bottle feeding these baby calves just really lit me up. And so we went over there and uh, I bought those calves myself with my money. I paid $300 a piece for them calves, those baby calves. And one of them I named Bobo. She died very prematurely, very young. She never could get colostrum. She never had a chance really. Uh, but the other one I named Rowdy Girl. And Rowdy Girl thrived. She became the reason I wanted to get up in the morning. She became the reason I'd run out there, you know, uh, uh, you know, in the middle of the heat and feed her. I loved watching her bounce to the bottle. I loved, I loved the way it felt feeding her. Um, there was nothing I didn't like about it. I loved it. And I wasn't a vegan. I was a cattle rancher's wife. And I was eating hamburgers, filet mignons, chicken McNuggets, whatever. And uh, I was finding myself um, entering into a world and into a dimension that I was not prepared to prepare for, really. Um, my background uh, parallel to all this is also in yoga. I started practicing yoga 
very, very early in life in the eighties, when I had a, a very bad car accident as a result of my alcoholism. And I almost broke my neck and it was a pretty, pretty bad wreck. I didn't have a seatbelt on. I was going 80 miles an hour. The car spun out and long story short is the, the seat that I was in, uh, my back and my neck broke that seat and I ended up in a fetal position underneath the, the, um, the seat I was in, you know, the backrest. And um, because I was so inebriated, I didn't even know how bad it was. Um, I didn't end up in the hospital. I didn't want to go to a hospital. I didn't want to go to a, I didn't want anybody to know anything because I was afraid I'd go to jail and I would have. Um, so my boyfriend that was following me that I was mad at, he picked me up. We fled the scene of that horrible crash. And the cops that found the car also found my purse that I'd left there. And they, they said, you know, whoever was in that car was either dead or in a hospital. And I was neither. I was, um, you know, jacked up or whatever. And uh, I went into that police station and I got my purse. I don't know how I did it, but I did it. I walked in there with a very stiff neck and they thought, well, it wasn't her. And the reason why I did that is because my daddy was in town and uh, we made up a story that I had left my purse in the car and that somebody he was seeing there, there at this nightclub stole his car. And anyway, we made up a story, right? That was back in the 80s. Um, early 80s. And anyway, I tell you that story because what happened because of that tragic, you know, near death accident is I started practicing yoga for because of severe pain. And the practice of yoga led me to studying things like ahimsa, nonviolence. It led me going to going vegetarian, not for the animals, but because I was I was doing it because I needed to uh, get hours and certification. I have 630 hours teacher training in yoga and, uh, and Ayurveda. And so part of the curriculum through the years was a vegetarian diet. At one point, I even went plant-based, not like plant-based, like as a vegan, but I was, I was doing like raw stuff. I was, I was making my own cashew cheese. I was dehydrating, but not for animal rights. You know, I was doing it for this yoga thing that I was into and uh, doing whatever I thought Ahimsa was at the time. But nevertheless, I loved yoga. I, in my other life, um, you, know, you know, I had my own yoga studio. I, uh, uh, you know, and so I gravitated to what it meant to practice Ahimsa. I just never connected the dots to the animals. So what happened um, as I began to get to know these calves is my yoga training began to kick in high gear. And I began to understand the meaning of ahimsa. And I began to have real conflicting emotions about uh, you know, these animals that we sent to the cell barn. Um, twice a year, my husband would load up the calves and send them to what's called a sale barn, S-A-L-E. It's an auction. That's where, um, you know, cattle ranchers take the babies from a cow-calf operation, which is what we had, um, to market. And they're taken there when they're anywhere from six seven, eight months old, you know, if they're nine months old when they're taken, that's older, that's pretty old. So the calves on our small ranch would not be taken away from their mothers like right at birth. They were actually able to bond with their parents. Um, they were able to uh, develop communities um, and they were able to feel safe until that one bad day that my husband used to always say, you know, the cows only have one bad day. But um, I know now that's just not true. They have lots of bad days. Um, 
But on the bad day, um, well, before the bad day, my husband and his partner would um, go out there and take the red trailer out there in the middle of the pasture and they would create a like a trap. They would bait the babies to go into the trailer. Uh, and the way they did that, you know, was they would put sweet feed uh, into the trailer and they would put a chain over the opening so that only the, the young calves could go in, the mother cows couldn't. And so the babies would go in there, you know, it would take a few days for them to trust the process. And then when there was five or six or seven of them in there at the same time eating, uh, my husband and his partner would pull the chain, slam the gate and take off. And uh, the first time that happened, I was shocked. Uh, the first time it happened, I saw the babies bust in tears, like on the spot. Um, their eyes bug out. I, uh, I saw the mothers chase the trailer crying to the top of their lungs and it wasn't all the cows running after the trailer only the ones that had babies in there and uh, I saw them follow that trailer all the way out and then when the trailer and the truck took the turn to go up highway 35 we had a mile and a half of highway those cows took a turn and galloped along that fence line until that red trailer was out of sight. Um, first time that happened, I was so shocked. I stood there in the middle of the pasture and I was, I was, Tears were coming out of my eyes, you know, and like they are now. Every time I tell a story, I, I get all emotional because I see it, you know, it's vivid. Um, that I used to participate in that is uh, not something I'm proud of. So that's why when I'm asked to talk about it, I do. Because if my story can help anybody else, make a decision to change the way they do them, do things, then um, that's my service to humanity and to the animals. Um, I would, I would go in the house. The first time I went in the house and I was screaming to the top of my lungs and I'm not vegan, you know, I'm card carrying omnivore, probably made spaghetti and meatballs that night. But I went in and I said, Tommy, how can we do this? How can, how can we participate in, in, uh, in, in, in this, in this? I mean, what we were just, what I just witnessed was so, so terrible. And listen to the mama cows out there. They're, they're crying to the top of their lungs. They were just, they would just wail and cry and looking for their babies realizing they were never going to see them again, grieving in the most gut-wrenching way. And my husband was in there watching the news. And I could not stand it. And all I know is it had to be because of my training in yoga. There was something starting to, it's like, it's like the circuits were beginning to hook up in my in my consciousness, I was beginning to um, realize there was something wrong with this, and I, I told Tommy, I said, I can't, I can't handle this. He said, Renee, you're going to have to, uh, you're going to have to handle it. This is what we do, you know. We feed the world, and that, you know, that's what we do. And I would storm out, slam the door, and part of what I learned in some of my training was to go to the earth 
and bend, go to my knees and just scream in the ground. And I did that. Every time those babies went to the cell barn, I would grieve with the mothers. And I would go to my knees and I would beg forgiveness. It was very uh, lonely. I didn't know I was, I didn't know I was on a path to go vegan. I just knew I was on a path to my heart opening for these animals that I, um, when I was a little girl, I used to um, make little coffins for dirt daubers. Like if dirt daubers died or lizards or anything died, I, it, I thought it was my job to collect them and put them in little, you know, match boxes or whatever I could find and give them a funeral. I did that all the time when I was a little kid. And so I, I resorted or reverted to my very childlike nature. And I started making little crosses for these babies. And I would name them. And I would put them in the ground crying. This was all very lonely, very, um, it was just me and the cows. And I would ask God to forgive me. Cause I knew it was wrong, but I didn't know it. I knew it was wrong inside, but I, but everything I was taught, everything I was taught to believe, not only, you know, what my husband was telling me, but what tradition was telling me, what churches had told me, uh, you know, that this was right. You know, I was taught to believe something that was wrong. You know, I was taught to believe in normalized violence, you know, and, and I didn't know that at the time, but, the, but that's where the conflict for me really began is because I was always a girl that loved God, that was very spiritual. I grew up in the church. Um, you know, um, did Bible study all the time, loved studying the Bible, um, taught Sunday school, you know, but we always had, you know, every Sunday we'd have cookouts or whatever, and everybody bring a dish and everybody ate animal products. I mean, there was, there was never any time in church where anybody talked about that being wrong. We always prayed over dead bowls, you know, animals and floating, you know, we would pray, pray for, thank God for that food. And so, you know, everything I had taught, we had been taught was that that was right. But something inside of me was telling me it was wrong. Not only was it wrong, I began to see it as murder. And nobody told me that. I didn't have a vegan uh, group around me. I didn't have any, I didn't know any vegans uh, except for Rowdy Girl, you know? A uh, rowdy girl was a vegan. And, and, you know, I do believe that the sentience of cows, you know, that there's a, a way to tune in to them. And, um, and at least this is true for me. I get, I get messages, you know, they don't like talk to me like in real human language, but I get impressions when I'm with them. It's because it's kind of like a radio station, you know, when you tune in certain stations, you get it, you know. Uh, if you could tune in to a cow, you can get it. That's all I know. If I tune into a goat, I get it. You know, you just got to tune in. You can't tune in, though, if you can't get quiet. If you can't be with them, if you're eating them, you certainly can't tune in. But what started happening is I started going in and out of... Um, uh, I would be in their world and then I'd be in the world of a cattle rancher. I would go from when I would be feeding Rowdy Girl, Rowdy Girl would take me into their world. I would, I would, it's like, if anybody has ever read the book Celestine Prophecy, 
um, it talks about how vivid things become when the more awake we get, the more aware, the more enlightened, the more awake we become spiritually, things get more sharply in focus. And so when I was feeding Rowdy Girl, I could see every line on these cows. I could see how long their tails were from one another. I could distinguish them all apart, even though they were just about all black Angus. I could tell them apart. And I, I don't know how that happened, except I just know when I was feeding Rowdy Girl, I became very interested in tuning in on them as if I was uh, able to see everything about them. And I began to name them one by one. And I didn't name them as in, oh, I think I'm going to name you today. It was like they, their name emerged in that time with them. Their name became part of that moment. And I was like, oh, you know, there's Robo. Oh, there's Red. Oh, you know, well, you know, there's Tippy, you know. And it was like, it, it didn't, wasn't like I was just out there going to go name them. It was like, they were telling me their names. And so I just said it out loud. And so I would go in and tell Tommy all about the cows and their names. And I was all excited. And he would say, Renee, you can't name them cows. You don't do that. And I'm like, well, why not? I mean, they're naming, they're telling me their names. And he says, oh, Renee, stop it. You can't name the cows. If you name the cows, you know, you, you get attached to them and you won't be able to sell them. And we, you know, we can't keep all these cows. And I wasn't a vegan. He wasn't a vegan. I didn't know any vegans. I didn't even know the word vegan. I didn't even know the word vegan. All I knew was I was having an awakening on a Texas cattle ranch. I was having a bona fide spiritual awakening. And that stuff takes time. You know, I didn't just one day all at once just wake up and go vegan uh, on a cattle ranch. It was an evolution of my heart and soul and mind. It was, uh, it was, it was, it was me challenging everything we were doing day by day for five years before I went vegan. You know, I remember coming in and telling Tommy, why don't, you know, why don't we sell our own cows? I mean, why don't we uh, eat our own cows? How come we sell them? Why don't we, and we, we eat, you know, we buy T-bones and filet mignons and all that from the store. Why don't we butcher our own? And uh, he said, Renee, I, I don't want to talk about that. And I was like, well, why not? And uh, he said, well, because I don't want to talk about it. I said, well, I do. You know, I want to know if I'm going to be in this business with you. And uh, by that time, you know, I was because I was, you know, more involved. I said, if I'm going to be in this business with you, then I want to know why. I said, because, you know, as far as I can tell, you know, if we're going to send animals to the cell barn, I'd much rather, you know, just go ahead and kill them right here. At least I would feel like I was doing, you know, right by them, you know, as stupid as that sounds. Uh at least they would die on this land instead of being sent off to some auction, terrified, you know? And uh, Tommy looked at me and said, Renee, we can't do that. I said, why? He said, cause I can't eat an animal I know. And I was like, well, that is just messed up. You know, you can eat, you know, we can eat animals we don't know, but we can't eat animals we do know. Well, what the heck is the difference? So. And I even said stuff like that. I said, oh, so, you know, if I don't know somebody down the street, is it okay for me to eat them? And he said, Renee, don't be stupid. Don't be. I said, well, you know, I, it just began to, it, it began to be very combative in my home. I began to challenge him every single day. It wasn't every month. By this time, you know, I was doing research. I was trying to understand the business we were in. And uh, I started stumbling on all, all this PETA propaganda is what I called it. Because my husband called it that. He said, oh, you're, you're just, you know, looking at all that PETA propaganda. And, uh, 
And I thought, well, maybe it is, you know, and they're just telling lies, you know, they're really in there, you know, making all this up to make uh, ranchers look bad. And the more I studied, the more I researched, the more I began to realize that it wasn't propaganda, that it was truth. And the things that I saw were hidden from, from view. It didn't like, you know, I mean, if, if you go to the grocery store to buy a chuck roast, you know, if right beside that, there was a, a video camera showing you how that animal died, uh, I bet you wouldn't buy that roast, you know? And that's what I began to see. I began to witness with my own heart, with my own eyes, with my own soul, the suffering of these animals that didn't deserve, they didn't deserve this. Um, in the world that I believe in, in the God that I believe in, no God that I serve would ever put animals on this planet to be tortured the way they are in animal agriculture. Um, it is, it is horrific. You know, billions of cows are in existence today, not because they want to be, but because of their bread to be in existence, just to live a few months or a few days and suffer horrible deaths. And so I began to see all this and I began to internalize uh, their suffering in the most it was horrible. I was, I, I got extremely depressed. I wasn't vegan. I was going to church. We were Presbyterian at the time. And my husband was an elder in the church. And um, I began to have issues. I, I, I just, I began to, I was so angry. Uh, it was like I was living in two worlds. Uh, I really felt schizophrenic. <laughs> uh, I, I would live in the world of the cows where everything was great and everything was like, I, I could only imagine that this is the way God really wanted it to be, you know, mama cows with their babies, living on a land, you know, siblings together. I mean, I, I can only imagine that God would really want it to be like that that God wouldn't want them, cows to be taken away, baby cows to be taken away from their mama, ran to a cell barn, shuttled through an auction, fed up in a feed lot, you know, going down a kill floor, terrified. I guarantee you, no God I serve created them to be treated that way. And I don't know how we ended up here in this, on this planet participating in uh, a business called animal agriculture that is nothing but a killing machine that we all are complicit to if we eat animal products. You know, uh, and I began to see that. And I, and I couldn't do anything about it because I'm married to a cattle rancher. I'm married to a cattle rancher that I love. And I began to despise what we were doing. He began to hide it from me at every turn. Every time he went to load up the calves, he, he had to do it when I wasn't looking. He had to do it when I was going to my mom's or, or, or something. And then I'd come home and I'd hear the mom was crying and I'd know. And we'd fight and I'd cry. And so in order to, to really punish myself, I would go watch more slaughterhouse videos. And I would scream and I would cry and I would beg my husband I said, please, let's stop doing this. You know, please, let's stop doing this. And um, so that happened for about five years. And uh, the last year was the toughest. Um, Tommy retired from Dow Chemical. He worked there for 40 years. And he was going to retire. And he was going to, uh, Tommy used to be a big hunter. He used to hunt all the time. And he's killed I don't know how many animals, you know, with guns and, and bow and arrows. And I, 
you know, and, and all their heads were all over our house and stuff, you know, I mean, everywhere. And, uh, but, but, but in the last few years, Tommy didn't hunt anymore. He didn't want to hunt. I mean, that's kind of like what happens to a lot of people that hunt. They, they stop, they stop wanting to do it the older they get. They've killed enough. And Tommy was uh, wanting to, instead of hunting animals, he wanted to hunt relics, you know, metal detecting, arrowheads. You know, Tommy's really into history. And so he was going to retire and start going on all these trips because, you know, and, and, and do metal detecting, look for, you know, uh, old coins and old buttons from, you know, Civil War days and, you know, all that. So, uh, and he's very good at it. He's got quite the collection. But anyway, uh, I remember he had his retirement party. That was in September of 2014. And we had it at our church. And in October, on October 31st, 2014, I went vegan. Um, in February of 2014, that was the last time a red trailer ever went to market. That was February, 2014. From February to September was our horrible at our house. We were fighting all the time because I was blocking him. I didn't want to sell the animals and he was not going to take Rowdy Girl. He was not going to take Houdini. That was her baby. And, you know, we were fighting all the time about, you know, about it all the time. And um, in September, when he retired, you know, after 40 years, he really thought his life was going to take on new meaning. He was going to go do what he finally wanted to do with the rest of his life. And then a month later, I pulled the rug out from under him. Uh, I didn't do it on purpose. You know, it didn't like I, I, I sought out to make his life a living H-E-double-L. But what I did was I was watching all these slaughterhouse videos and then one day I stumbled on uh if y'all have y'all ever heard of Dr. Melanie Joy Dr. Melanie Joy is a PhD and she um she's the one that kind of coined the term carnism and she's she's got a book out uh several books but the one that really uh stuck out the most for me at that time was one called why we eat pigs, uh, wear cows, and love dogs. And, oh my God, I, you know, I thought that was the most interesting title. And, uh, and I stumbled on a video on carnism where, and, 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 and the back, the back story of this is I had watched a bunch of slaughterhouse videos. I've been crying. Tommy was like, hey, would you shut up in there? And, you know, and I was like, well, and I wasn't vegan yet. Uh, this was the day and I didn't know it, y'all. I didn't like, I didn't have any vegans waving flags or screaming at me uh, or spilling blood all over themselves or, you know, I had none of that. I had a spiritual awakening on a Texas cow ranch because of a calf named Rowdy Girl, <laughs> you know? And so I, um, I, I, uh, Stumbled on this video, and all of a sudden, I'm like, in the story, there's a, a family sitting around a table, you know, typical Sunday dinner. They're having beef stew, and um, the lady of the house brings out this pot of beef stew and starts ladling it out for everybody, you know, and she says, uh, you know, everybody's enjoying it, and they're eating their stew, and then somebody says, well, what's the recipe? And she says, well, you start off with a pound of very young golden retriever. And I, I, yeah, exactly, Rose. My mouth, I was like, oh my God, I could be eating a puppy. Who knows what's in that bowl, right? I mean, if it's chopped up, bodies in a bowl, how do you know what it is? I mean, they can tell you it's beef stew, but it could be. It could be a, a golden retriever. 
hell, it could be a human. Who knows? I mean, flesh is flesh, you know, come on. You know, I don't know why I always thought, you know, human flesh could never be food, but it could be. Uh, you know, why are we so special? And anyway, <laughs> anyway, I, I just kind of lost it for a second. Then she went, oh, just kidding. It's really a cow. But everybody had stopped eating. They could not they could not resume their eating because the image of a puppy being hacked up in pieces was in their mind. They couldn't continue. So what was once a very savory bowl of beef stew became a bowl that they pushed away and wanted to regurgitate. So what was it really up here, right? So, so that evening, October 31st, 2014, um, we went to my mother-in-law's house, God rest her soul. She always, every year had a big block party for all the kids, uh, the, the, you know, well, there was always a big block party there on Halloween and the little kids dressed up and, you know, they, when, you know, everybody went up and down and got candy, it was a very safe way for all the kids to participate. And every year she would make, you know, something for us to eat. Well, I went over there with Tommy. And my sister-in-law, brother-in-law, nephews, nieces, little kids were all there running around. It was very, very uh, festive for Halloween. And I walk in and my mother-in-law comes out with a pot of beef stew. <laughs> On the same day that I had just seen this. And I was just like, you know, that's a, well, my, um, my ears started ringing. My, uh, my eyes bugged out and I was like, I can't eat that. And I said it out loud. I, she didn't even ask me at that point. It was just like, I just said it. I said, I can't eat that, you know? And she went, well, Renee, why not? I said, because it's got floating dead, hacked up animal bodies in it. And I, I just can't eat it. And everybody in the house stopped talking. They looked at me like I had cussed my mother-in-law out. And I said, what? It does. It's got floating, dead, hacked up animal bodies in a bowl. Oh, my God. Everybody was like, ew, you know. And uh, my mother-in-law said, well, Renee, you know, you can pick it out. And I said, no, there ain't no more picking it out for me. That was it. I went vegan. It was as if. I, the rug was pulled out, the lights came on, uh, my DNA that was ready to go vegan lit up and everything that was oppressed in me shot to the surface. It was all on top of my skin and I became Tommy's worst nightmare. I'm a cattle rancher's wife. He ain't vegan and he ain't going to be bringing none of that stuff in my house. He ain't sending none of them animals to the cell barn over my dead body. You just try it. And so the war was on. And it was no longer, it was no longer, it, hey, it, I was vegan now. I was full on vegan. I ain't one of these that went kind of halfway vegan. When I went vegan, it was, I, I, I slid in and it was all she wrote. Um, and you know, I told Tommy, you ain't eating any more animal products in this house. I said, and I want to take all these horns off the wall. I want you to dig a big old 30 foot hole down there. We're going to have a funeral. And I mean, I began to be very, you know, uh, I, I was, I was as vegan as anybody I know now, but I didn't know any vegans. <laughs> uh, well, I didn't know one. There was one I knew because I'd gotten to know her, um, the day I went vegan or the day after. And uh, she's the one that convinced me to start Vegan Journal of a Rancher's Wife, um, which was the very first Facebook page I ever did. I don't, I don't, um, I don't post on it much anymore, but I used to all the time and I would pour my heart out on this page. And man, what happened was, Vegan started coming to my rescue because my husband was going to sell them cows. He was going to get rid of all of them. He was going, because we were going to get a divorce, y'all. I mean, it was over. 
our marriage was over. I mean, here, here we were married twice. And now what was breaking us up was that I went vegan and I wouldn't let him sell the cows. And so he wanted me to stay out of his business. And I was like, well, this ain't a business no more. This is, you know, these are sentient beings out here. I've learned that word. And uh, I said, and they, 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 they're not going to the cell bar. Well, what are we going to do with them? You know, I said, well, I don't know yet, but we ain't sending them to the cell bar. They can just live right here. And, uh, and he was like, Ray, we can't do that. They'll get pregnant. We don't have enough land. You know, we can't just, you know, have babies and babies and babies, you know, you got to sell them. And I was like, well, we'll have, we're going to have to figure that out. He said, no, you know, and so anyway. We were at an impasse and he was going to sell the whole herd. And so I, I got on uh, Facebook, started talking to my friends. Uh, Kip Anderson was one of my friends at the time. He's on our board now, but he's the one that kind of told me, he said, Renee, you know, why don't you buy your husband's herd? You know, uh, why don't you do a fundraiser, you know, and, uh, you know, I can show you how to do it. And, and uh, so anyway, uh, or maybe he didn't tell me I should buy them. It was it was my idea to buy them, but it was Kip's idea to help me on a fundraiser. Um, and so I went to my husband. He didn't know I was on. He didn't know I was on Facebook with a a Facebook page called Vegan Journal of a Rancher's Wife. He had no idea. And I said, Tommy, I said, look, we were out in the middle of the pasture. I said, if you're going to sell off cows, why don't you just sell them to me? He said, sell them to you? Are you crazy? I said, yep, I am. Full-blown crazy. I said, I am ready to buy these cows. You know, he says, how are you going to buy them? I said, well, uh, I'm, what if I can buy them? What if I, what if I can raise the money and I can buy them? Will you let me buy them? He said, sure, Renee. He played along, you know. I said, okay, how much? He said, well, I could get 35 or 40,000 at the cell barn right now. I'll sell them to you for 30. Ha, ha, ha. He laughed, you know, he thought that was funny. And uh, I said, okay. And, uh, you know, would you let me lease your land for a dollar a year? He said, sure, Renee. I said, for two years? He said, sure, Renee. So he said yes to everything, thinking I would never do it. He never thought I would, but he's a man of his word. You shake that man's hand and whatever he could, whatever you, whatever he said he'd do, it's done. And so <laughs> anyway, we shook on it. And uh, I went to my friends and I started making that fundraiser. And in less than four months, I raised $36,000 and bought his cow. And, um, you know, Every step along the way, my husband became more and more convinced that I was doing the right thing. He didn't understand it, but he never liked sending his animals to the cell barn any, either. You know, he didn't like it. He just, you did it because you had to have a tax exemption. You did it because you had to, you know, pay tractor notes. You, you did it because it was a business and that's what you've always done, you know, in the past. That's what your grandpa did. That's what your great grandpa did. And you, you think you're doing something honorable. And, you know, I remember when I told my husband, you know, I remember, I'll never forget the day I told him, you know, you take that trailer up the road one more time and I'm in it. I will follow you. I will go to the cell barn and I will buy every single one of them cows back with your credit card. And I will bring them back home. I remember the, the moment like it was yesterday. The look on my husband's face like he was totally defeated because he knew I would do it. And that's that, that one decision of me moving to Angleton instead of him going to Pearland. This is what it came to. And that's the reason I'm on this talk with y'all tonight is because this story somehow when the word got out, it was like, it was like our world was dry and that, that flame of this story lit on fire, something around our world. 
we're we're known internationally, you know, uh, now, and our story's been translated in nine or ten languages. We have uh, over a hundred and four or so farm animals animals here, sixty three cows um, that we take care of. It's uh, our expenses are, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty six thousand dollars a month. Uh, I don't know how we do this, except as a nonprofit, I, I'm constantly asking people to become members. I'm constantly, you know, uh, creating campaigns for their needs. Uh, we've, uh, we've escaped three floods. Um, whenever we were in Angleton, we were flooded in 2016. We were flooded in 2000. 17 is Hurricane Harvey, and we were flooded in 2019. And every single time, I never thought about myself first, other than, you know, to make sure I could do whatever I had to do to get them cows and those animals to safety. And then we got ourselves to safety because I had to get them animals to safety three times. Our house flooded twice. And I don't know how we're still here, but all I know is that our, our, our sanctuary. Rowdy Girl Sanctuary is your sanctuary too. Our story became your story and it's been told all over the world. And, um, you know, I don't have to be there for somebody else to tell this story. Um, as a result of this story, we now have the Rancher Advocacy Program. And um, that happened because uh, cattle ranchers and their wives began reaching out to me when our story went viral on CBS Evening News, on ABC. Uh, Southwest Airlines did a big feature story in their magazine, and it was in every magazine on every airplane. Um, Animal Planet, documentaries, we've been um, in many of them. And so now, you know, cattle ranchers and their wives reach out and when they do, I'm just there to listen and I understand. And uh, now, you know, my greatest hope is to see cattle ranchers and animal farmers transition out of animal farming into plant-based farming. And I'm hoping that we can be a catalyst to, to do that. And as a result of our awakening, other cattle ranchers have gone vegan. Uh, there's transition programs, you know, starting up all over the world. And so, you know, you never know what your story is going to do to impact those around you or the world. And uh, my husband's now vegan. He is co-founder of Rowdy Girl Sanctuary. He went vegan first for his health, then the environment, and now he's full on an ethical vegan for the animals. So. You just never know, you know. Uh, I, I think that's probably about it. We moved, we moved from Angleton to Welder after our third flood. We, uh, we had just bought this property here. We have 147 acres, uh, an hour from Austin. And um, here we are. Thank you.